welcome the U.S. Department of Energy's Chief Commercialization Officer, Connor Prohaska. Good morning. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and ask my panelists to come on up for this uh, fireside chat, and I'll introduce them. So once again, we've got a, a, a very exciting uh, panel to start off our second day. Um, we're joined here today by uh, Paul DeBar, Undersecretary of Science for the Department of Energy. Uh, he has a more important title, which is uh, to me, boss. Uh, and <laughs> so we, we, uh, that's where we start. Uh, it's, it's good to see you in a tie because most of the time when you're dealing <laughs> With the VC community, you're no uh, tie. You know, I'm <laughs> lucky to put a jacket on. <laughs> uh, and then also uh, our very special guest, Brad Henderson. And I'm going to give a quick intro to kind of set the stage and understand why we're here. Uh, Brad is the chief executive officer of what's known as P33, not what's known as P33. It's called P33, uh, which also known as <laughs> also known as uh, which drives. Uh, global technology leadership in the Chicago area. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about that. But prior to joining this job, uh, Brad led North American operations practice for uh, Boston Consulting Group. Um, and uh, was also a Rhodes Scholar, which is similar to being a Texas Aggie. Um, <laughs> <laughs> on the same level-ish. Um, and uh, he's a, a leader in the Chicago area uh, and has been entrusted with this very important charge or mandate of, of, of driving the technology uh, economy, more or less, an ecosystem. We're going to talk a little bit about that in the Chicago land area. Um, the Honorable Paul DeBar uh, serves as the Undersecretary of Science. Uh, in that role, he leads our research efforts at the Department of Energy um, and uh, has truly been a leader prior to this. Uh, was it J.P. Morgan? Um, and also served as a Navy veteran as well. And, uh, as did you. <laughs> and uh, has been a great leader and great advocate for uh, the research efforts and the lab system that we have here in the Department of Energy. Um, and uh, I think anybody that you talk to, uh, he gets pretty pumped up and excited about the research going on in the national labs. But taking that a little bit further, the impact that the labs can have. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll just start with a thank you, uh, but that he has enabled us in the Office of Technology Transitions and enabled our mission with resources and people to really attack this, which is why we're here today. Um, because what we have here is someone trying to grow the regional ecosystem around technology. We've got two national labs uh, here in the Chicagoland area, Fermi and Argonne, um, and a passion to merge those two. Um, so I think I'll start, Paul, with you. Yeah. Why are you so passionate about this? What, what, what got you started in thinking about merging the economy and regional ecosystems with the labs? So, you know, as, as, as ho hopefully people here who, who, who may not have known it before this conference, you know, did, you know may not know that the, the DOE National Lab System is the largest R&D enterprise in the world, mm -hmm. right? It's 60,000 people. Uh, it, it swamps, uh, you know, kind of anything else in the world in terms of scale, in terms of research. Uh, it's the largest generator of Nobel Prizes, right, right up there with the Rhodes Scholar. <laughs> uh, largest generator of Nobel Prize winners in the world. Uh, and so there's a tremendous amount of content, right? As, as you say, 18 billion, you know, is done in non-defense R&D. It's, it, it is a giant machine of, 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 of us creating content. Uh, and uh, so, you know, I think one of the challenges is how do we take you know, just an overabundance of content and how to connect it uh, with people who can, can apply it. Some of our research is very discovery science, some won't talk about, you know, black holes and dark energy and dark matter. So we do a lot of discovery science in, 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 in the complex, which is very important for humanity. But there's a lot of what we do which is incredibly applied. And I think our biggest, you know, I got passion about this because every day when you go to the lab complex and a number of the lab directors here who, who run basically all our, the university system here that we run or our research university system that we run um, is that we produce, you know, so much and how do, we, how do we get people connected and then vice versa. I think it's very healthy for the researchers in our labs 
who are running supercomputing here at Argonne uh, or others uh, to hear about a market pull mm -hmm. of what would be interesting for us to do research on. And it's just input. Uh, we don't have to you know, tell, do exactly, but at least that conversation, that community uh, expanding, I think is very valuable for us. So Brett, you and I did a tour of Argonne a few months ago. Um, and after kind of seeing the stuff, you had this, as most people do, if you haven't visited a national lab, please do because you'll walk away with a, with a wide eye, but you said we're missing some translation. Yeah, I, it was an incredible visit. I mean, I'd, I'd lived in Chicago for 25 years and I'd never been out there before. And I was blown away at the quality of the people and the quality of the science. It was one of the most exciting days I've had in years. But, but when, when I think about um, the role that commercial Chicago, as an example, plays in bringing that science to life, the distance between the way the information is presented today, which is fantastic information and world-class insight, and what a busy executive who's making decisions about where to allocate their investment dollars can understand quickly. Uh, it's a real opportunity, I think, for the national labs and for deep science in general. Being able to answer the question, what does this mean, why does it matter, when does it matter, and what should I do about it, is very important for taking these brilliant ideas in this world-class research and really making it uh, have an impact on our world. So what is P33 trying to accomplish? So if you, P33 has a very simple mission, which is to take Chicago and the Chicagoland region and think of that as, as far as our supply chain extends, so even into southern Wisconsin and northwest Indiana, take this wonderful world-class uh, set of assets and people. And if you think about Chicago, just basic stats like it's the number two market in the country for computer science graduates. Right? You think about a school like uh, Urbana-Champaign, much of the foundation of the internet came from that school. So how do you take 35 Fortune 500 companies, uh, a very promising incubation system, actually a quite diverse uh, incubation system where 34% of our companies founded here are women founded, uh, and world-class research in universities like University of Chicago and Northwestern, how do you take those assets and ensure that the things that they deliver for, in terms of jobs, uh, in terms of economic output, and in terms of impact on the world, that that's tier one in terms of its outcomes. The data says right now we're not quite there. And so what P33 is doing is basically we've assembled 300 leaders from all walks of life around Chicagoland, university presidents, leaders from our tech community, leaders from our civic and established business community and said, we need a plan. And not only do we need a plan, we need to make that plan happen. And so what P33 is, is essentially the way to catch all that enthusiasm and talent and direct it towards the biggest problems we have in front of us and make sure that by the year 2033, um, which is 14 years from now, which will be the 100th anniversary of the World's Fair here in Chicago, that we're back on top the way that we were in 1933. I get it, 33, 33. And if you think about it, if, if we, there's, a, there's a great news, if anyone has a spare moment in the, uh, at the end of the conference, there's a, great, there's a great exhibit at the Chicago History Museum on the 1933 World's Fair. And what you see is in 1933, the city of Chicago, this was the center of the innovation universe. This is where design and manufacturing came together to give us the television, the first cell phone, um, all the industrial engineering that, that makes our world what it is today. Um, how do we get back to that spot? So Paul, how do we fit into not just the Chicago version of this, but in a lot of regions, New York, I mean, Houston, Salt Lake City, name it. Uh, how does the Department of Energy play a role in something like what Brad's trying to do? Yeah, so, you know, our, our job uh, for, for the most part is really about content creation, mm -hmm. right? Our job is not uh, to actually, from a commercial point of view, to do commercialization, your chief commercialization officer, but it's about pushing technology out uh, of content. And so for us to, uh, to make those connections, uh, and, and you know, a, a little bit of uh, you know, theory, it's, it's kind of hard when you're, in a, when you're in a, uh, with a broad scope that all of us have, uh, you know, how, how do you focus? When I, when I took a look at the, the, the footprint and, and the impact that we're making, um, you know, the, the, for our biggest footprint in the country is in the San Francisco Bay Area. We have three national labs there, it's very big. Um, and the way I took a look at it was, uh, you know, uh, there's obviously always greater potential, but our lab director at Stanford and others here do an excellent job of connecting with the tech community. Uh, and um, so when you're taking a look at where's our next biggest footprint, right? Our next biggest footprint was in Chicago. And, uh, and there was a, a gap between 
the, what was what, what the good work that Argonne and Fermi have been doing, deep work, 80 companies on battery research alone, uh, but the opportunity there, given capital, uh, given companies, uh, given the footprint, and what more could be done, you know, took a look and said, you know, Chicago is clearly, you know, like, uh, you know, very high in the list of, of what we can do more on. So we, we, you know, so how we could integrate and we moved down the road. So uh, Paul and Nigel here who run the labs connecting with, uh, connecting more with, uh, with the downtown area and with the help of, uh, I think, science's uh, biggest support, uh, Congressman Foster, thank you for, uh, the National Labs Congressman, uh, not just here, but everywhere, uh, and, you know, to help discover the top quirk and decided to, uh, to take his expertise into Congress, uh, amongst other things, but clearly in this area. So I'd like to thank him for his particular leadership uh, around Chicago and these topics, uh, but also for the, for the country. So not to put, uh, and we're leaning in, but one of the things you also say all the time, uh, Paul, is that we, as the Department of Energy, we are not, we're a part of this, we're not this, and we're not everything. You know, we, we wanna drive, we're content rich, we wanna drive some discussion about this, but we're not everything. So I'll pose the question first to Brad, what's lacking, what's missing? Uh, don't wanna put other agencies on the spot, uh, but we're leaning in, what else needs to happen? Yeah, I think, I think uh, one of the most important things to understand when it comes to commercializing deep tech is it's really hard. So the, the process you follow that's sort of the standard cookbook for create an MVP, get a prototype, test it and see if it works and kind of do that over the nine to 12 month period that's typical for bringing an idea to market doesn't work at all um, for deep tech, right? And deep tech really takes a community. Uh, it takes startups working with investors, working with not-for-profits who play critical roles that fill a gap, working with the U.S. government who provides things like RPE or other funding sources to bridge the gap, working with corporates who are willing to actually use some of their R&D dollars to bridge the gap, working closely with scientists. And so when you think about the journey to bring a really complicated idea in something like advanced materials, that could take seven, eight, ten years. And so what you really need is a, is a dense network, a tight ecosystem, where people are interacting fluidly uh, and learning from one another constantly. That's not easy to do. That doesn't happen in a lot of parts of the country. And so the, the thing that excites us, that, that we're looking for, we think we have those pieces. But what do we all do together to make sure that that stew uh, is made? We just don't keep the pieces apart. Same question. Yeah, so, um, you know, it, it, and I'll pick out a, a couple of examples. We invest uh, the, the American taxpayers' money for innovation on very specific things that we're good at and we see that are very interesting. So the two things that once again I'll pick here in Chicago uh, as examples uh, is on battery research mm -hmm. and on, on quantum technologies. Uh, you know, uh, I think many people in Chicago may not realize that basically uh, the Chicago area is really the leader of innovation in those two topics. And I think many people don't, you know, don't, don't realize that. And so we're putting a lot of money into beyond lithium ion batteries. Maybe we could get to cars that could go uh, 800 or 1,000 miles of charge, right? I mean, these are some monumental kind of jumps in terms of performance or, you know, helping stand up the first entangled quantum network in the world, internet in the world. Uh, that's happening here, right? And so uh, for us to be able to take that and engage with the local community and say, hey, we're doing some pretty interesting stuff. Yeah. Uh, it has practical applications. Those two examples have incredibly practical applications. Um, and uh, for us to kind of bring it close to where the community sees it, that yeah. it's there, uh, and, then, and then ultimately hope to find capital or industry that will grab it, right? Mm -hmm. And to kind of move it forward, because we'll only take it to a certain point, right? And because that's our job, our job is a research institution. Um, and so how do we make those connections on those specific things? And once again, you know, the, the user inspired research, right? As I, that's the kind of the term I was talking about earlier. It'd be great to hear, you know, from the local community to say, hey, we think that we have the right, you know, we're interested in, you know, there's capital here to invest in this. There's manufacturing interest. The state might be interested in helping or the city or, or, or industry. 
to kind of pull that from, you know, from research to deployment or manufacturing. Yeah, and, and, and there's a, an important point in there that we talk about a lot, which is we're not trying to change the basic science mission of the Department of Energy. It's just a little, I think the department traditionally has had this idea, we'll just, we're going to, what I call the artillery shot, we just shoot it out and hope somebody catches it. Yeah. Um, and, and we're going to put some great content out there. Where do you find that line between commercialization and basic science? Yeah, I mean, and, and kind of heading down a little bit farther down the road of what you commented, you know, uh, you know to, once again, to a large degree, you know, the DOE is just a large you know, set of research mm -hmm. universities. You know, the historical way of universities, by the way, not just DOE, but if you go to Stanford and you go to Berkeley and Caltech, you know, the typical way of communicating your ideas is to write a paper and put it in Nature magazine and, and talk with other researchers. You know, that is an absolutely important community to be a part of, because that those are your peers. But there's different communication tools to try to move something out the door. And, and there's a little bit of a challenge with the, with the National Lab Complex, because obviously the, the complex came from the Manhattan Project. Mm -hmm. and, and there's a, there's a mindset, not only just a mindset, but we have ongoing research we do for national defense. So some of our labs, literally have a fence around them with a high degree of security because we still do not the most defense. opening place yeah and it's not the most <laughs> open that's exactly right and it's not just physically but it's a cultural point mm -hmm. right and even if you don't work on national security topics everyone's kind of part of the culture of you know uh, of of hey we work in a place with a fence around it and some people are working on things that are that are defense related when the majority of it is not right and so so there's a cultural point there's an academic cultural point there's the fence, fence, fence around, you know, the lab, you know, kind of point. And so how do we break down barriers to increase uh, networking, increase communities? It's not to replace communities. It's to add another community. And that is around, hey, how can we take some of these ideas and not just publish, but actually actually talk with people at events like this and, and, and use local organizations who, who do Brad, what can you, I mean, uh, not what can we do, what can you do to break down well, that, and, and that's my sense is that actually regional uh, bodies like P33 can really lean into that as well and meet the labs in the middle. Mm -hmm. And so I'll just take a, a very basic example from Chicago. Chicago is blessed to have a, a whole suite of food companies, food and ag companies. This is in many ways one of the true industrial hearts of food and ag. If you're a food and ag executive right now, you're saying to yourself, the, this notion of uh, alternative proteins is going to change our business forever. And so where do I go fund those ideas? Conceivably, as a Chicago-based executive, I can just fly to places like California and Boston and get all the answers and call it a day. Um, that's not a very competitively advantaged strategy if you think about your employee footprint. And so in Chicago right now, there's a really interesting example of how we might think about deep science differently. And so there's a company here called Sustainable Bioproducts. A su sustainable bioproducts is used, they, they make an alternative meat protein. They basically can print sheets of meat. Um, and they used five different uh, US federal government research sources to develop that technology. It came from Yellowstone National Park, a professor at Montana State, partnered with a food executive. It's now being incubated out of Polsky at the University of Chicago. And the part that I love about this story is the, the actual manufacturing footprint they're starting with is in the back of the yards in Chicago. So think about things coming full circle. If we were here 70 years ago, the back of the yards was the center of the meat processing industry in the world. Uh, it's come full circle through the help of national lab research uh, to be there again. That's the kind of problem solving we need. Think about all the people who had to be involved with solving that process uh, and how important that is for a regional economy. We all have to step up to take advantage of that research. So Paul, let me ask you as we wrap up here, um, the Innovation X Lab series was your brainchild, your idea, you're the inspiration. Your execution. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what was the thought process? Uh, how do you feel like it's going? If it's negative, you can save that and tell me in DC, don't yeah. say it here. Um, <laughs> so, so, so the idea was, you know, once again, on the basis of how could we add, kind of add a, add a community, right? Add a set of dialogue on top of existing dialogues. So one of the challenges, you know, that I saw was that most of the dialogue was uh, a certain company in Chicago talking with, hey, I know Argonne exists and I'll go talk with Argonne. When in reality, no disrespect, Argonne's wonderful. I love all 17 labs e equally. 
<laughs> uh, always very dangerous conversation. Perfectly equal. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, is that the reality is maybe the piece of research that's applicable to a company in Chicago is not Argon, right? And it, it could be, it could be because it's a topic that's not there. And so a lot of the dialogue was between a lab and a company, and that may not be as inclusive of the area of research that's going on because it may happen in multiple labs. So rather than having a lab specific event, you know, with a particular company, was to actually pick a technology mm -hmm. or an industry and then invite all the labs that that affect, you know, that do research and do work on that particular topic and bring them all together and then once again invite academia, labs, academia, uh, capital and manufacturing and end use customers all together to kind of increase awareness, increase dialogue. So the first one of these that we did, uh, so this is our fourth one. Mm -hmm. Once again, we're doing it based on a technology or an industry. First one was on battery technology. We did it at Stanford, our lab at Stanford. Second one we did was on grid technologies. We did in Seattle with uh, Pacific Northwest Lab as a sponsor. Third one was advanced manufacturing and 3D printing, mm -hmm. uh, which we did at Oak Ridge. This is the fourth, and we have two more coming up uh, already on the schedule for next year. Uh, in January, we have a biomanufacturing uh, X lab at Lawrence Berkeley. Nobody's going to stick around. That was the big announcement. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, and we're looking to do uh, a quantum one uh, in New York City uh, in uh, in the late spring. Great. And Brad, when we talk about uh, not just DOE leaning into this, but 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 uh, the the X lab being here, how? Chicago is opening up more or less through your organization. Yeah. Um, I, I also want to talk about, because we are at an artificial intelligence summit, what do you see with artificial intelligence and the efforts that you're doing? That's what I love so much about this event, is that if you think about artificial intelligence in the lab, it's citing some of the most profound questions about human um, nature and where we're headed, uh, you know, the, the ability to, to really bring um, that technology to a, a level that we only imagined in science fiction books 20 years ago. That's really interesting. But if you think about Chicago and our 35 Fortune 500 companies, this event creates an opportunity to say, what does AI mean for fraud for one of the largest credit card companies in, in, in the world? So if you think about the 40 million customers that uh, are associated with our big credit card company here, their lives are affected every day by fraud. If you can apply AI, uh, more effectively than what they're doing. You can actually help people's lives. You think about institutions we have in Chicago, like Chicago Mercantile Exchange, where almost all of the prices set for every financial instrument around the world occur on servers here in Chicago every day. Imagine the impact that AI could have on the world if we did that well. And we just are full of those companies that are actually in people's living rooms, in their pocketbooks, et cetera. And that's what I think is so critical, is how do we take world-class science and fundamental questions we're asking and make sure they end up impacting people's lives. That's the promise of events like this. That's the criticality of asking the question this summit is asking. Paul, what's your message as far as this outreach, the, the way we can touch with our research um, to other communities? We're talking a lot about Chicago. We're here in Chicago, um, but, but we're not a one-trick pony. We, we <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, so uh, given that footprint of who we are, right, and we cover all the different energy areas, we cover all these different sciences, obviously also cover defense topics, you know, the application of AI kind of broadly is, 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 is so vast, it's hard to kind of get your hands around. And so you can pick any one of our offices. If you're interested in, in grid technologies or solar and renewables or battery uh, chemistry design, literally we have something going on in pretty much every one of those areas around AI could, that could be kind of helpful. So let me just give you one example, right? Maybe someone's here from, you know, Exelon's here as, as a sponsor on the utility side. So the director of Pacific Northwest Lab is here. Uh, one of the things that they've gotten, uh, they've been driving research is AI for grid management. If you think anyone about how, to, how an electrical grid should be run, it used to be kind of three people in a control room twisting dials. Mm -hmm. That's not really the right way to go do it, right? And so Pacific Northwest Lab, and I was picking on, on Steve here because he's up front. Uh, and, uh, it, First mistake. Yeah, they, they've, you know, they, they've, they, they've developed about over 15 different AI applications for different versions 
of optimizing management of power plants and resources and their grid. And if you just think about the electrical grid, it's just a massive amount of data on what weather and where the dams are and water and, and, and the specific nodes and cyber topics. It's a long list. And so it is just ripe right, for AI applications to manage which power plant should turn on, when and where, depending on all that data, and how to minimize costs and how to increase reliability. That's just one. This is one topic and that we just completely drilled into for AI. And you can go one after another after another. And pretty much, you know, whatever you're interested in, anyone in this room, there's probably some, you know, there's probably some application that we are working on someplace across the complex. So I, I, I want to wrap it up, um, and, but I, I do want to thank uh, Brad for being a, a really a great partner and opening up your arms and your effort at P33 to what we're trying to do and, 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 and really engage in the regional ecosystem. Um, we really appreciate it and it's been, it's been a great partnership so far. Eager to grow. More to come. Um, yeah. and, thank you as well. Yeah, and uh, um, Paul, thank you for your vision for this, this event and this series. Um, I think it's been a great opportunity you are the leader in opening up the arms and business of, of Department of Energy to the world. So uh, if you'll join me in a big round of applause for our panelists. Thanks. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. So now I have the uh, pleasure uh, of, of introducing our next speaker and uh, our keynote for the day, one of our keynotes for the day, uh, Dr. Colin Paris uh, from GE Research. Dr. Paris is currently the Vice President uh, Software and Analytics of Software and Analytics Research at GE. Uh, he took this role in 2014. And he has two major responsibilities at, at GE Research, uh, at GE in general. Um, he's responsible for industrial, in, industrial analytics, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and software systems research for the entire company. And he also leads the digital twin initiative across the General Electric Company. Vice President uh, of, of GE Research, Colin Paris, is, is happy to be here today, uh, and I don't know where he is exactly. There he is. Uh, so if you'll join me in welcoming Colin Paris. Pleasure being here. Yes, sir. Hi, good morning. It is my delight to be here. So what I'll spend my time doing is talking to you about two things. Talking to you first about GE's journey using industrial AI. Our focus there is to extract business value for our customers and then talk about the ways that the National Lab has helped us previously and a possible path forward. So let me start by first giving you our motivations. What drove us in this direction? So. If you look at GE right now, we have a significant number of critical assets that we use in giving value to society. Start with the 70,000 engines, you know, roughly 35,000 in the commercial space, the other 35,000 in the military space. When you look at that, we have 300,000 people in the sky at any possible moment, 300,000 souls that have to land safely every time. You look at the steam and gas turbines and wind turbines, one third of the world's electricity is being generated there. You look at the healthcare scanners, and these are just the large scanners, 16,000 scans a minute. This is all infrastructure that's been around, a jet engine lasts 40 years, a steam gas turbine 30 years, a wind turbine 20 years, a scanner 15 years. Trillions of dollars of assets here on, for use on the planet, helping and supporting society. Now in the background, you have our customers themselves who have to produce value from that, financial value. And they have drivers they look at, right? Increased probability, increased productivity, faster growth, adaptability as many things change with the minimal of business risk, and improved safety. 
Now, what's different now is not that you have to do one or two. You have to do all four at the same time. Then you look at the dynamics below it. The dynamics are extreme. Now, we no longer think about our customers, but we think about our customers' customers. When we design a jet engine, we don't think about the airlines. We think about the people actually flying on the airlines and what they want. When we actually think about generating electricity, we don't think about simply the utilities, but the end customers as well. So you're thinking about your customers' customers. Then you also look at this very dynamic environment we have in our markets, in which competition is not coming from the usual competitors. It's coming from people you never knew. You look at Amazon as the example there. Starts off delivering books, then retail, then web services. Now Amazon actually has Blue Origin. Investment Bezos made in 2000, spent a billion until 2010, then a billion per year for the last five years of his own money. And he produced an engine that actually right now is being used by Boeing and Lockheed in their new launch vehicle. This competition coming from nowhere, the speed of competition. Elon Musk does the same thing. We look at the influence of governments with the tariff situations. You're managing in that type of dramatic, dynamic environment. Then you look at the capabilities by digital, which is what we're here to talk about. First, it was used to access data, then access services, then access people, then access assets in autonomous driving. Now we use it remotely to have drones do inspections for us. So all of this is the landscape we walk into, with those assets that have been out there for 40 years, with all of these new drivers, and we tell ourselves, how do we use AI to help us deliver more value? So what we did next is we began a journey about six, seven years ago to start looking at people who have used AI in the right context. Who were the leaders then? What did they do it, do with it? How well did it go? And a journey led to these three leaders because they all use the same way to use AI to transform their businesses and have a major impact. Now, when you look at it from a business perspective, those three leaders last year produced over $634 billion of revenue. 265 for Apple, 236 for Amazon, 135 for Google. I've been at the IBM company in General Electric all my life. It took IBM 97 years to get to 100 billion, General Electric 106. The oldest company here is 42. The rate of growth and rate of change by these capabilities is astounding. Then we looked at it and we said, what techniques did they use? And to our surprise, they all use a similar technique. Let's use Amazon. It starts off by gathering data. So what Amazon does, it began by getting demographic data, data about groups. Then it quickly saw that wasn't enough. You have to collect more data, data about individuals. So they looked at what you bought, when you bought it, what you bought it with. You know. What did you buy? Mother's Day, Father's Day, Christmas time? Who sent you things on these dates? It created a set of data about you, not a group, but about an individual on how you buy and when you buy, from demographic to psychographic. It used that data and AI techniques in order to actually understand how to propose things you buy. Segmentation. If you actually belong to the segment, let me sell you something that the segment wants, these books. Profiling. If you're looking at ads and a number of customer reviews for skis, let me offer you skis at a discount. Prediction, if you do buy the skis, can I sell you the helmet at a discount? Use of AI in that system actually allowed it to hone the AI and the ads it would show you. So it went from a model of one to a PNL of one, a PNL uniquely positioned at you and every one of its 300 million possible customers. Then it takes that capability and it puts it in a platform, a software platform that you can reuse very quickly to quickly deliver it from books to retail to movies to music, web services. And this is how it grows that quickly. And the same pattern is repeated with Google and Apple. Google uses the data it gathers on your Google searches, on your Android phones, on your Google Maps. And it quickly pulls that data together to get the model of one and then a PL of one in which it could sell you ads. And Apple does the same thing from iTunes, gathering that data to actually use it and put it in a platform to go from music to applications to home to health. 
We took that same idea, evolved it, innovated it, to apply it to our assets. So a jet engine. Initially, we gathered data about the fleet. Then we began to gather data on the individual jet engine. How it was manufactured, how it was designed, how it was serviced, where it flew, how it was operated. We gathered the psychographic data about it. Then we began to apply, instead of fleet analytics, focused analytics. Before in fleet analytics, we made assumptions. We say, given this asset, and we assume it's normally flown this way, in this environment, we'd make an assumption on the life of a part. We'd say a part would last two years. But now that we have the exact data on where it was flown, the pressure, the temperature, and the contamination between two sites, and the manner in which it was flown, what was the D rate, when did it climb, we can now precisely tell you this part would last four years. You don't need to bring it in after two years or 20,000 cycles. This way you don't need to pull the asset out of availability for the customer. You can fly it until we tell you to bring it in. That's the life. Then the performance. Before we made assumptions on the performance, we said normally these assets in this environment, managed this way or operated this way, would perform at this level. This is the fuel e efficiency you would expect from it. But now that we have the exact data, I can say this is the fuel efficiency you're entitled to. When that changes, I can tell you when the plane lands overnight, use a foam wash and clean the contaminants that are right now on those blades, on those turbines, to regain that fuel efficiency. If I actually show you how to preserve life and increase, frequent, and, and increase efficiency, I actually control economics. So I go from a model of one to a P&L of one. Then I put that in software, and then I move it from aviation to energy to healthcare to transportation. And this is the journey that we've been on on something we call the digital twin, a way of extracting value. It's a way of using the knowledge of the physical asset, combining that with the data that we have, and using that to extract insights, insights on the life of the assets and the parts, insights on the operations or the efficiency or performance of the asset. Now that you've extracted insights, no value is attained until you do some real work, until you actually do something about that, whether it be that you replace a part or whether it be that you clean some blades to get more efficiency, you've got to take that action. Once you take the action, you get feedback. And that feedback allows you to put that back into that digital twin, that living learning model, and it gets better. Then also, if you collect enough of that feedback, you have information that can give you the ability to design. Now, we all build models, and we all build them usually when we do design or when we have a service problem. What's different now? The difference about this is that this is a learning living model. Every time that plane lands, I take a snapshot of data. I know the routes it flew. I take a snapshot of the state, and I update the model. It's a living model. I look around, and I look at the fleet. I look at things I could simulate. I look at humans doing experiments, and I use that to give added value to the model. It's a learning model. This model is a model of that specific engine. It's a personalized model. This is a personalized living learning model. What's different in the industrial space? Why is it industrial AI? So I live the life of a data scientist. If I was in Amazon in 2014, they had 2.4 billion, billion packages selected, purchased. So as a data scientist, I had a lot of data. In Google, 10 million ads a day in 2014. I have a lot of data. Now when I look at the GE90 engines, what are we thinking about? We're thinking about when will we get a failure in a part? If I look at failures in the part on a million flights of a G90 engine in 2014, it's 22. It's not big data. So where do I get the rest of the data from? I get the data from the insights about the design, the manufacturing, the services. I get the data from simulators that I build. I get the data from real-world experiments. So that combination of the simulators, the real-world experiments, the insights I have, plus that sparse data that I have, gives me the ability. 
And what do I do with this twin? How do I really deliver value? Because that's what I'm about at GE. In three ways. We take the twin, which is an AI process, and we embed it inside our services process. If you notice, this is the way AI is monetized. In Amazon, it's embedded in a commerce process. In Google, it's embedded inside the ad advertising process. In Apple, the entertainment process. In GE, it's embedded inside the services process. We look at three things. Can I, with that digital twin, give you sufficient early warning on a failure? Now, early warning at a certain time. Normally, we have compressor failures and you find out at the gate a light goes on on the cockpit. Or you find out a day before. You notice some difference in certain readings on vibration. Can I use the twin, as we've done, and predict it 30 days in advance? In th because in 30 days before, I can then take an action that results in we can repair or we can actually trade that asset out for a different one. And so no flights are interrupted. Early warning. Second is continuous prediction. If I fly this engine in a hot and harsh environment, contaminants get on the blade. So those contaminants wear away at the thermal barrier coating around the blade. It exposes the metal. The metal, when exposed to this extreme temperature, cracks. We call that spoliation. Can I predict, based upon the flight paths, the contaminants at that time, the pressure and temperature, everything in that region as I fly? Can I predict? the level of damage. So if I do that, as I said before, I don't need to bring it in every 30,000 cycles. I can tell you exactly when to bring that in. And because of that, we can reduce the outages or the planned times you bring that asset in. That generates $91 million of value in 2017. This is continuous prediction. Can I do optimization? Can I look at your fleet and tell you which assets you keep continually flying into a hot and harsh environment and tell you Fly those assets into a colder region, a less contaminated region. You're not changing your flight schedule, you're just changing the aircraft you use on that schedule. If I do that, I prevent you from having too many assets that all get damaged at the same time. Because if they all come in for service at the same time, you have to lease additional engines. That leasing cost can be huge. For several of the airlines, that total was 45 million that we saved in 2017. Just telling them how they can optimize their fleet using it in a different way. This is the power of the twin applied to services in aviation. Same power exists when you apply it in energy. You can take a wind turbine and you can actually get sufficient early warning on a gearbox, on a cell, a generator. And I can, with sufficient time, say go do these minor repairs to prevent significant breakdowns. Those things amount to roughly $4,600 you know, per turbine per year. These wind farms may have three or 400 turbines in them. Or can I do continuous prediction so I can elongate the life of the battery I have? I can tell you how much to load it based on the chemical composition of the battery, when to charge it, when to discharge. You don't always charge it to 100%. You don't ever discharge it fully all based on a variety of things. The voltage, the, the current, the temperature at that time, the number of cycles you've done it on. Again, a twin can help you predict that, which is what we do. We can do dynamic optimization. In these combined cycle plants in which you use a gas and steam turbine to generate electricity, because you're using combustion, as you actually have a combustive event, when you mix that fuel, and that air and you ignite it, you damage those parts. You need to actually have more combustion to increase the temperature, which increases the mechanical energy you can derive from it, which allows you to do more electrical. So I can, more heat put into this system, I can actually get more electricity. However, that heat damages the parts. Can I tell you that there's a time to run less efficient with less heat when electricity prices are low, but when the prices are high, and sometimes they can jump to three or four X, can I save enough of that damage that I can overfire it when the prices are high and cause you to generate more profits? And that's what we do in these combined cycle plants to add an additional one to three million a year. Up until 2017, we tracked the number of twins we had. 
1.2 million twins generating $580 million of value. It's increased significantly since then. Now that we have these twins, this is how you deliver value. Now we're in an industrial setting. So how do you actually get people to adopt and accelerate that value? So we created something, a capability known as humble AI. We first established that AI was valuable in the industrial sense. We've shown people that you can deliver half a billion dollars worth of value. So everyone's eager. But now they're eager, but you're dealing with trillions of dollars of assets. So how do you do it in the right way? Reduce business risk, as well as encourage adoption. So here's what Humble AI does. Humble AI gives you the ability to understand what is your area of competency. Where are you most competent? Where does that AI algorithm have the least uncertainty? Deploy it there. If you're outside that region of competency, use the deterministic algorithms you've used before, and then the AI system will tell you, I need more data. Give me more data to expand my area of competency. So that's the capability. So when you do this, you say to yourself, okay, how do I do that? What I do, for instance, in this case, between four and six miles per hour, in four and six meters per second wind speed, I have the best data. So I create a system that operates then outside, I ask for new information. How do I get that information? I can get it in a variety of ways, simulations, or I can get it actually using experiments. The route here we have to actually make these twins better is always to get from these twins, how do I get ground truths? So in this case, in an engine, when I predict a failure, or I predict damage, I actually go in and inspect, get that damage, and then update the twin. As I update the twin, after a while I could even improve the design of that coating. So that is how I enhance value. Now I have another technique. After I update it, and I improve this value, could I redesign that blade to give you the capability using additive manufacturing to have a brand new design. I call that an immortal machine. I've changed the mind of it using digital twin, and I've changed the body using the blades. We've partnered in several ways with the labs, in a variety of ways around wind farm design, power plant design, getting these beautiful simulators that help us design these things. Now that we have this capability, We've used the combination of data-driven methods, as we do here in oil and gas, and simulation methods, and combined them. Real-world data added to the simulation data. Here, what we're doing is trying to get the right mixture of CO2 and water to get the right oil out. Now, we do them separately. We find the simulation methods a little bit better, but more costly. When we do them together, we find we have the ability in Humble AI to find that zone of competency from the data we collect, but with the simulation we have the ability to extrapolate and find new regions that we couldn't have before. The power of simulations and real data. This is our new journey. Our new journey now is to actually try to understand how we do just that. If we look at the things we have in the white circle which are areas we can simulate, and the things outside which we gather real-world data, we use that to build a surrogate model, an approximation. And from that, we use an optimizer to optimize. Then, according to Humble AI, what we do is we can do more experiments where either via the simulator, as we need to learn, or via real-world experiments, get more data for more optimal solution. But also, our surrogate model can be curious. It can actually go into the massive simulator, that we have, and it can actually increase its uncertainty, reduce its uncertainty, sorry, by doing its own experiments. Now we have a better surrogate giving you better task optimization. Now what we are doing is saying, we can also figure out, because we know every time we run a simulation, we get the same answer, but when we run three different experiments, we get different answers, there's real world variability. We can insert that real world variability back into a simulator, like a powerful one at the national labs, and we can create simulators that are even better. Simulators that allow us to truly join together on this journey 
the journey to build an immortal machine to attack the biggest problems we have in wind, in aerodynamics, and in manufacturing. G would welcome anyone who's willing to help here, the brilliant work of the national labs, to find ways to come together, bring in their simulation capabilities with our real world capabilities to again give us a new future. Thank you very much for your time. Paul Kearns, director of Argonne National Laboratory. I just need to. <laughs> Good morning, Colin. Thank you, tremendous, really uh, quite impressive. Thank you for really talking with us about the value of AI and the new journey that General uh, GE is on. I should say, forgive me. Uh, and also, uh, I think I can speak on behalf of all the laboratories engaged with GE Research. Uh, really, we value the partnership. We're great. Uh, GE Research is really great to work with. And the edge challenges regularly to, to be a bit more thoughtful and a bit more uh, insightful on our approach, which we really do value. So thank you very much for the, the being here today and sharing really uh, the vision on where you're headed. So thank you. Appreciate that. It's my pleasure, uh, I have a pleasure actually of introducing Bill Foster, Congressman Bill Foster, who represents Argonne's 11th Congressional District, which includes the northern half of Argonne National Laboratory. Uh, we're very pleased, as I said yesterday, and fortunate to have two uh, congressmen, and, and uh, Congressman Foster is uh, really uh, known really very uh, for his uh, great uh, interest in science and the compassion he brings really to his work. And, uh, really leading uh, the congressional delegation uh, in terms of their support of the national laboratories, and so we appreciate that very much, Bill. The congressman is the only PhD scientist in Congress. Uh, during his tenure in the House of Representatives, Bill's been a strong advocate for robust funding of scientific research. He's championed support for Argonne's two largest user facilities, the Advanced Photon Source and the Argonne Leadership Computing Facility. He previously represented Illinois' 14th Congressional District and has served as the 11th District since 2013. He is a member of the Financial Services Committee and the Science, Space, and Technology Committee. Most relevant for all of us here, Bill was named Chair of the Financial Services Committee Task Force on Artificial Intelligence. We hope this XLab Summit will inspire and inform the Congressman's policy work on artificial intelligence. Please join me in welcoming Congressman Foster. Uh, thank you, Paul, and uh, I'd also like to just acknowledge uh, Paul DeBar's wonderful leadership and his role in making this AI um, summit a reality. Uh, I sometimes introduce myself as saying that I represent 100% of the strategic reserve of physicists in the U.S. Congress. Um, but uh, I, I worked at Fermi National Accelerator Lab for 23 years before uh, moving into politics, and I'm currently the co-chair of the National Labs Caucus, which is uh, an organization of members that uh, that are, we are systematically visiting all of the uh, all of the national labs with as large a congressional delegation as we can. We've I think hit about 40 percent of them. And it, it's really wonderful to see the, the honest enthusiasm for, for Congress people um, when they realize all the incredible science that's going on there. Um, I'm also um, one of the sort of rare members of Congress that has a real business background. When I was 19 years old, my little brother and I started a company in our basement that now manufactures about 70% of all the theater lighting equipment in the United States, including, if I'm not mistaken, I think the lights that are, that are illuminating this hall here. Yeah. Okay, um, and so um, I'm also uh, represent 100% of the strategic reserve of artificial intelligence programmers in the U.S. Congress. I, I, I try to keep my technical neurons from atrophying completely, and as I moved into politics, and it's a um, and. So I guess it was t about two shutdowns ago when a certain senator was holding the floor of the House of the Senate, um, and as the whole government was shutting down, um, and I just couldn't stand it anymore. So I went and downloaded TensorFlow, uh, Google's open source AI engine, and worked through the tutorial on that. And it was quite remarkable because the um, 
the algorithms that are used inside that are not that different from ones that we used you know, back in the, in the 1990s to classify particle physics interactions. But what's different is just this enormous increase in the size of the data sets and the, um, and the compute power behind it. Um, and you know, we run into the exact same problems today. You know, we're on financial services, we're struggling with problems of, of privacy, obviously, and also what's called explainable AI. You know, we discovered back in the 1990s that if you tried to publish a paper saying you discovered a new subatomic particle because your neural network said so, it was very difficult to publish, basically impossible. And now if you try to deny someone's mortgage loan because your neural network says so, it's not an acceptable answer uh, to a human being. And so we're wrestling with those same thing, same problems. Um, I'd also, you know, as, as chair of the AI Task Force on Financial Services, I'd be remiss in not pointing out that actually the, uh, the high frequency trading center that's called Chicago is actually in my congressional district. Um, it's out in Aurora, um, where if any of you who've read Flash Boys, uh, where they're talking about stringing uh, high frequency uh, trading links. Uh, first is fiber optics and then microwaves because they're too slow. At the far end of that um, are, is out in uh, near Eola Road in Aurora. And, and I, we're also very involved in the future of work. Uh, I, I'm, as a member of the New Dems, I've been chairing for a couple sessions of Congress now um, a, a group that's looking at the impact of artificial intelligence on what the jobs of the future will be. And I think the thing that's underappreciated is how quickly those are going upscale. Um, I visited not long ago uh, one of the uh, giant too big to fail banks and the trading floor on the too big to fail bank. And, and the trading floor, um, which used to be these open outcry pits, is now uh, two acres of people staring at big screens. But I asked the guy who runs the, the trading floor um, how quickly artificial intelligence is going to replace those jobs. And he said that, that honestly about a third of the jobs could be gone today. Uh, and that uh, their baseline plan is that half of them will be gone in, in five years and 95% gone in, um, in 10 years. And they're thinking of accelerating that schedule. And these are people with master's degrees in finance getting half a million dollars a year. And so this is not just farmers and factory workers and, and truck drivers that are at risk here. And I think we should realize as quickly as possible that we're all in this together. Now, there's some strategic issues in AI, management of AI, uh, from the Department of Energy point of view that I amuse about a lot. Uh, one of them has to do with the bifurcation in the hardware, in the specialized hardware, between the three main things you need, training, inference, and simulation. Um, it, the training is large data sets and large data centers, and I think that's pretty well mapped out. Uh, the inference, I think, is going to largely happen on small portable devices where the, it's low power um, and aggressive pruning of the neural networks and this sort of techniques, and, and also continued advancements in silicon efficiencies that are really going to be the key thing. I think national labs are going to have a hard time uh, competing in that area with the tremendous amount of money that's going to uh, be going in from the commercial end. Um, this, it's the simulation end. Um, you know, if you look at how uh, self-driving cars will be trained, they're largely trained not on real life data but simulated data. And having high fidelity physics models for everything from driving a car to jet engines is going to be crucial and that is, uh, that is a natural and existing skill of the um, of the national labs, and I think that's really the, the strength there. That and curating data sets, especially ones where there are privacy concerns like the veterans, like the veterans' medical data. Um, and so that's the, that is the areas where I think the national labs really have a competitive advantage that will persist. Um, and, and there's a, a big area of research that will have a huge effect, and that's in uh, what's called zero-knowledge training. Uh, this, ha this has to do with being able to train your neural network on a data set that you cannot see, which for privacy reasons will be very important. So you know, the, the dream here is that you'll be able to have your Gmail that only exists in plain text on your cell phone, and yet uh, people will be able to train their neural networks on that without seeing the without seeing it. And so this is, um, that's an example of, of the sort of research 
And the, the, the strongest contribution of national labs is, is in manpower development, um, and that has to be in collaboration with the universities and, and the whole DOE research structure, because the best strategic plan in the world means nothing if you don't have the people to execute it. And that's why I'm really thrilled with how rapidly uh, DOE is responding to engage in, in AI and getting it involved, uh, not only for new breakthroughs in AI itself, but getting it applied rapidly uh, throughout the research, research enterprise. So I want to thank you all for being here, and uh, this is really a thrilling time to be involved in AI and the National Labs. Thank you all. Please welcome Rick Stevens, Associate Laboratory Director at Argonne National Laboratory. You never can tell whether the music's going up or down. So uh, it's my uh, great pleasure this morning to introduce uh, Dr. Uh, Rebecca Willett. Oh, we, we call her Becca. Um, she's a professor of statistics and computer science at the University of Chicago um, with an expertise in machine learning, signal processing, and large-scale data science. Um, uh, Becca got her PhD uh, at, in com uh, electrical and computer engineering at Rice University and uh, served as a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Duke and uh, before that was an associate professor uh, in Wisconsin. She was a uh, Harvey D. Spangler faculty scholar and a fellow of the Wisconsin Institute for Discovery. Um, she's uh, received a National Science Foundation uh, Career Award in 2007. She's a member of the DARPA Computer Science Study Group and uh, received an Air Force Office of Scientific Research Young Investigator Award in 2010. So please welcome Rebecca, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's an honor and a pleasure to be with all of you here today. I thought I would share with you some perspectives um, coming from academia on the tremendous potential of AI and some of the major challenges and opportunities that we face as we move forward uh, and how through a partnerships between academia, government, and industry, uh, we can rise to, to meet those challenges. Uh, so as I'm sure all of you are aware, and part of the reason that we're all here today is because of this tremendous potential associated with AI. Uh, researchers are actively investigating how we can use AI and machine learning to improve the energy efficiency and the transportation systems of major cities like Chicago. Uh, they're investigating different ways in which AI can improve healthcare including different wearable health monitors or improving the quality of image reconstruction, uh, or even analyzing things like electronic health records in order to identify best practices or risk factors for diseases that were previously unknown. AI is also being investigated in terms of making better forecasts, forecasting extreme weather events like hurricanes, or forecasting elements associated with precision agriculture that help us make better decisions about where to water, where to fertilize, and where to apply pesticides. Uh, it's also playing an increasingly large role in basic scientific research, helping us guide which experiments we should run in which order to accelerate the discovery process. Uh, and then, of course, it's helping us buy products, including takeout. Uh, in fact, there was a recent report by the uh, Computing Community Consortium on a 20-year roadmap for AI in the United States. And within that report, they highlighted six sectors that they thought had particularly large potential for being transformed by AI in the coming years. And when we look at these sectors, we see things like healthcare, education, business and industry, scientific research, including the kinds of work being done by the Department of Energy, um, social opportunity and public policy, and national defense and security. And when you look at this list, it's, it's really hard to imagine any aspect of our lives that's going to remain untouched by artificial intelligence. Uh, in fact, we can look at lists of different areas where researchers are actively using artificial intelligence and some of these, like the ones in red, are just unmitigated successes. Uh, there, we have made progress in things like computer vision and speech recognition 
that 10 or 20 years ago would have been thought of as just pipe dreams, totally unrealistic uh, academic endeavors that weren't really going to see the light of day. And here we are today, and many of us are using them on a day-to-day -day basis on, on our phones. So when you look at a list like this, you might be inclined to think that AI is at a state where it's a collection of, of toolkits on software that I can use whenever I've got a new data set. I get my new data, I plug it into this toolkit, and out comes a brand new success or savings or, or, or new opportunity. Uh, and this is not an uncommon kind of approach. So people like Jeff Hinton, an AI luminary, said a couple of years ago, uh, that it's quite obvious we should stop training radiologists, that the computer vision systems that we have developed in recent years in AI are so sophisticated and advanced and are so capable in terms of almost matching human capabilities that humans are not necessary for radiology. But at its core, when we think about how machine learning works, what it's doing is learning by example. And so if we have um, example or, or, or data that is not reflected by these examples, by this training data, then machine learning methods are going to fail to reconstruct or to recognize what's in, in, that, in that data. So here's an example of this notion in action in the context of an MRI scan. So some researchers took an MRI image of a brain and they added in a little bit of text. It says, can you see it? And there's a little diamond there. And then they simulated the kinds of measurements that we would get from a real MRI scanner. And they said, now let's try to reconstruct that image from these measurements using a state-of-the-art method uh, based on machine learning. Uh, and this is the result. And when you look at sort of the background brain material, it really looks quite excellent, representative of the state-of-the-art. But when we look at this artificial text that was added in, it's reconstructed very, very poorly. And this is because that kind of text was not represented in the training data that was used to train this system. Uh, and if you were to think about perhaps having an oddly shaped tumor, this might be somewhat concerning. And in contrast, we can look at classical methods for reconstructing images from the data from MRI scanners, and we see a very different picture we see a level of, of robustness to these oddly shaped tumors that isn't present with the machine learning approach. Now, this is not an indictment of AI or machine learning methods. Instead, I think that it illustrates and the opportunities that we faced, but also the need for investment in continued research in not only this application, but in many other areas in which we want to start using AI and, and advancing it. And so then you might ask, well, what's the right approach to start tackling these kinds of problems and trying to increase the adoption of AI into all of these different kinds of, of applications? Um, and in general, I would say that there are two distinct viewpoints or approaches uh, that, that people tend to adopt. The first is to say, hey, AI is amazing. Look at all the cool things that we can do. It's really impressive. I can download TensorFlow during Senate hearings, and it's a whole lot of fun to play with. And so let's just adopt it everywhere. Let's try to figure out how we can make it work in application A and in application B. And it's just a sort of gung-ho, can we get something to work attitude that's very exciting, uh, and often somewhat of a trial and error mindset. Along the way, we develop benchmark data sets and competitions that really push people to innovate and engineer better and better solutions. Now, the contrasting viewpoint is that AI, while amazing, is also very curious. There, it does all kinds of things that I wouldn't maybe have expected in advance, that I don't know how to explain or necessarily interpret. And so this is not a bad thing, but it just is an opportunity for us to try to learn more about what's going on under the hood. So generally within this viewpoint, there's a stronger focus on, on theory, trying to understand what are the failure modes? When might these things start to break down? Or when do I have enough data? Or when do I not have enough data? And there's a strong emphasis on things like robustness and correctness. And the reason for this is because there are many applications where the costs of mistakes can be very high. 
So if I'm trying to train a computer to recognize cats and it's wrong 70% of the time, that's not too earth shattering. But if I'm trying to train a computer to recognize tumors in an MRI scan, then I'm much more concerned about a 70% error rate and this trial and error mindset may be unacceptable. And so the approach is to, instead of just trying everything out and seeing what sticks, is to probe these systems and try to find their shortcomings and weaknesses in the hope that by understanding where they might fail, we can also understand how to make these systems bigger and better and more robust. Okay, so as we go along here, I'd like to show a few different examples of where there are opportunities for additional advancements in AI, where both of these different viewpoints that I've presented are important for trying to uh, advance the state of the field and for getting these different systems integrated into to new application areas. And the first area there is robustness and stability. And what I mean by that is simply the following. For a lot of systems, including things like deep neural networks, we lack a fundamental understanding of exactly how they're working. And one side effect of that is that sometimes I can make a small change to the input and get a huge change to the output in a way that I didn't necessarily expect. So this was illustrated a few years ago by some researchers at Google. They took this image of a panda and they fed it into their state-of-the-art image recognition system and it correctly told them that it was a panda. And then they made a tiny, small perturbation to every pixel in that image to produce a new image that, to you and me, looks exactly like a panda. But when they fed this new image into their system, it told them that it was a gibbon monkey. So a tiny perturbation in the input led to a dramatic change in the output. Now you might argue with me and say, you know, this was really a very carefully constructed set of perturbations. It's really adversarial. I don't know that it's all that, that relevant. And I would say two things to that. First of all, as we start thinking about how to deploy these systems and things like self-driving cars or in national security and defense or in the Department of Energy, we do want to make sure that our systems are not too vulnerable to, to adversarial attacks. But in addition, these same kinds of challenges show up in non-adversarial settings. So here I've got a video of a polar bear walking around from a BBC documentary. So it hasn't been doctored or made um, uh, hard in any particular way. And in these two frames, a state-of-the-art image recognition system correctly identifies it as, as a polar bear. But a couple of frames later, the polar bear, which is moving around, is shifted position. And that tiny shift in position, which is barely visible to us, results in a giant change in the output of the system. So instead of recognizing it as a polar bear, the system says it might be a baboon or a Madagascar cat or a gorilla. And this is not an adversarial example. This is an example that can arise very naturally. And so as we start to think about employing or deploying these kinds of vision systems in the wild and not just in laboratory systems, we want to work together to try to figure out how we can predict where these different failure modes might arise and how to design methods that are more robust, again, uh, more, more robust to those kinds of errors. Okay, so the second category of things that I want to describe corresponds to spurious correlations, or some people call them biases in the training data. And I'm going to start by showing you this in, in a very kind of trivial toy example, just to make the idea obvious. So imagine that I wanted to train a image recognition system to distinguish between cats and dogs, but I foolishly give it only pictures of cats that are indoors and dogs that are outdoors in the grass. So a perfectly reasonable machine learning algorithm might say, look, when there's lots of green pixels in the image, it's much more likely to be a dog. And then, of course, that leads to, to really sobering mistakes. Right? <laughs> OK, so it seems like a silly example. And of course, who would ever tr use training data like this? But in fact, this is a problem that arises uh, kind of pervasively. So imagine that I wanted to train a system to detect pneumonia from chest radiographs. And so I provide it with some that have no pneumonia and some that have pneumonia. And here there's no obvious analog to grass. I can't take a glance at this data and tell you that there's something off about it. 
Uh, but in fact, these same kinds of spurious correlations arise and a patient with no pneumonia gets misdiagnosed. And academic researchers have been looking at this phenomenon and they've discovered that tools like deep neural networks can in fact do things like base their decisions in part on which scanner was being used to collect the data, something that we don't really see when we look at the images, but which neural networks can pick up on. And so when we start to think about using these systems for making healthcare decisions or financial decisions or criminal justice decisions, we need to develop tools and mechanisms that will help us identify when these kinds of biases or spurious correlations underlie our data so that we can sort of um, avoid these, these missteps and mistakes. The final group of challenges that I want to describe is that of leveraging both physical models and human beings. So as I said earlier, machine learning is really about uh, learning from examples. Uh, and for the most part, we think that the data is going to tell us everything we need to know. Uh, but there are plenty of cases where that's not really the, the, working so well. So many of you might have read some hyperbolic articles about the coming robot apocalypse. Um, but the fact is that, as authors Gary Marcus and Ernest Davis pointed out, a lot of today's robots really struggle with doorknobs. So that gives us some, some pretty obvious self-defense uh, mechanisms. Now, I don't think this is a you know, fundamental challenge. We can figure out how to make robots open doorknobs. But what I do think it indicates is that the problem with today's robots is that they don't have a full physical understanding of the world. They don't know what a doorknob is and that they should be looking for doorknobs and they should be figuring out how to open doorknobs because that's just super important for taking over the earth. And so incorporating physical knowledge together with training data could give these systems a giant boost. And that's true in many different settings. So if we think about trying to use AI in the context of precision agriculture, I'm sorry, in, in the context of predictive maintenance of large scale equipment, or in terms of trying to design better materials or better pharmaceuticals, or even in terms of trying to build better models of atmospheric and oceanographic systems. In all of these cases, we understand something about the underlying science and we have models. Those models aren't perfect, which is why we want to start bringing tools from artificial intelligence and machine learning to bear on these problems. But nevertheless, we shouldn't discount all of that extra knowledge that we have in addition to our training data. And analogous things can be said about human beings. Of course, all of these systems are working with humans, interacting with humans on a daily basis. And it's an open question of how things are gonna change when we take an AI system that was designed and trained in an isolated laboratory environment and transition it to a setting where it's, it's interacting with humans that might behave in unpredictable ways in response to the AI. And what happens when the AI tries to learn from those human reactions? There are many things that we don't fully understand uh, within that realm. So a little bit more broadly, there are a variety of different areas where I think there's a need for both applications-driven and foundational research in order to advance uh, our abilities to UAI, uh, use AI. Uh, the first, as I just mentioned, is figuring out a way to integrate data along with physical models and human judgment. The other is trying to figure out when a method is going to work in the wild. If I were today to develop a new computer vision system and tell you, hey, this is working great in my lab, you should definitely plug it into your self-driving car, probably you wouldn't believe me, right? You would want some other kind of verification or some other kind of testing mechanism to know how it's gonna work on the streets of Chicago. And yet we need to develop ways to do those tests that don't endanger human lives uh, in the meantime. We also need ways to kind of measure whether we've got enough data and whether that data is diverse enough to avoid some of the, the biases and spurious correlations that I mentioned earlier. And to, uh, together with that, we need ways to quantify how much certainty we have in the models coming out of these systems and try to interpret them so that we can identify when they are making sort of judgments based on, on spurious information. And finally, somewhat implicitly in everything that I've said so far, I've been talking a lot about deep neural networks 
in part because they're, they're having a moment, they're very exciting and new and, and capable. But in many applications, it's not clear that it's the right tool. And so when we start thinking about using AI in new application domains, a key open problem is just even figuring out what's the right set of AI or machine learning tools that we should be bringing to bear on the problem in the first place. Now those problems might just seem uh, very challenging, and, and they are. But I want to make the point that I don't think they are beyond our reach. So at the same time that applications-driven AI researchers were making these giant strides in computer vision and speech recognition and other domains, there were people working on the foundations and the theory side of things that have made equally exciting advances and, and progress. And I just wanted to highlight a couple of them here. So one question in deep learning, for instance, is to what extent do these networks really learn something fundamental about what's going on as opposed to simply memorizing the training data? And recent research has given us a toehold for understanding that and figuring out methods that, that force us away from memorization. Theory also gives us insight into what makes neural networks special, what its advantages and disadvantages are relative to other kinds of methods, how to get methods to be more robust to the kinds of adversarial inputs I described before, and how to make systems simply faster and easier to train. So ultimately, leadership in this area requires sustained investment, not only in the specific potential applications of AI, but also in its foundations. And really, we're only going to be able to realize the full potential of AI through partnerships with government, industry, and academia. You know, I, I think right now, as we're experiencing this renaissance in AI, we think of some of the luminaries like Jeff Hinton and Yashua Bingio as, as always being the, the superstars that they are now. But in fact, they spent decades developing some of the algorithms and technology that underlie modern machine learning and AI, often with, um, while, while facing a little bit of scorn for pursuing an academic enterprise that was never really going to amount to something practical and usable. And so some of these investments that we make are necessarily going to have to be long-term and somehow coupled with the more short-term goals that, that we're also excited about. Uh, so finally, this, this interaction between these three pillars of academia, government, and industry hopefully will allow us to leverage the respective strengths uh, of, of each of them. Uh, industry, as, as we've heard already today, is wonderful at figuring out all the different modes of, of operation, the way people might actually interact with different devices and help us identify edge cases where AI might have shortcomings that we need to address. They're excellent at taking academic advances and helping to transition them to, to consumers and things that we can actually use. Uh, the government, especially places like the DOE labs, uh, do a fantastic job at taking academic innovations and really scaling them up to, to unprecedented levels to work on, on things like large Haldron Collider data sets, which are, are enormous. Uh, and they also have you know, a role in terms of oversight and regulation that I think is increasingly important as we think about using these systems in the context of healthcare and finance and public policy. And finally, academia. I hopefully have made a case that some of the foundational work going on in academia is extremely important in terms of, of making these ideas useful and effective and robust within the context of applications associated with, with industry and, and government. Um, by predicting failure modes, we can make these systems safer. Uh, and of course, last but not least, we are training the next generation of, of AI experts that will be making these ties even stronger. So thank you very much.